thank you very much for your very kind invitation. Um, today I'm going to talk a little bit about what happens to immigrants when they move to Canada. One in five people currently living in Canada do, were not born there, and 93% of immigrants live in major cities. This poses a unique challenge for the government as they try to develop successful settlement and integration strategies for newcomers. Successive governments have tried to manage migration in various ways, such as introducing fast-track migration op options to encourage immigrants to settle in less populated rural areas to fill job shortages. Um, these policies have had limited success, largely because international migration is an urban phenomenon. Immigrants move from big cities to big cities. And in Canada, two-thirds of all immigrants live in just three cities, Montreal, Toronto, and Vancouver. This presentation examines some of the reasons why immigrants still choose to live in the largest urban centers, despite government policies that dictate otherwise, and the availability of more jobs in the smaller rural areas of the country. Let's see if I can make this work. Ah, there we go. To fully understand the importance of immigration to Canada, I'm going to give you a little demography lesson. Canada has the highest proportion of permanent immigrants to native-born population in the world. In the past 10 years, 2.2 million people have arrived in Canada to live permanently. This number does not include the over 820,000 people who come to the country annually. They either come as students or temporary workers. Two recent research papers revealed that 90% of those temporary people end up staying as well. So you're looking at a number of about 1.1 million new arrivals every year. Now the government wishes to redistribute or encourage more people to live outside of Montreal, Toronto and Vancouver. And I just thought I would show you here the provincial distribution. Um, Ontario, which is where Toronto is located, attracts 38% of immigrants. Vancouver is located in British Columbia. They attract 14.1% of immigrants. And the French-speaking uh, part of the country, Montreal, uh, attracts 21%. But where do they live when they move to these provinces? Most of them move to the city. Um, so even the ones that move to Alberta, Saskatchewan, Manitoba, and other places, they don't live in the rural areas where there's more jobs. They live in the big cities. And so my question is, is why is that? So if you look at the um, city distribution, as I've already mentioned, the top three uh, cities of settlement are Montreal, Vancouver, and Toronto, uh, with Toronto being number one. Um, they're right here. And uh, uh, with uh, Montreal being number two, and Vancouver up here being number three. They account for 60% of the immigrants in Canada. That ha number hasn't changed in decades. That's, that's the pattern that's been followed. Now if you look at these three cities, they're very diverse linguistically, culturally, and religiously. In Toronto, 47% of the people who live there were not born there. In Vancouver, that number is 41%. Now, um, I don't know if any of you attended this session by Dudley Poston yesterday, but he was talking about how cities are networked. In other words, cities talk to one another. And so one of the big reasons that immigrants choose to move in, to Montreal, Vancouver, and Toronto is either the existence of family networks or cultural networks. So despite the fact that there's more plentiful jobs available elsewhere, they tend to move to these three centers. This is just an idea of who comes to Canada. Um, this is the latest data from 2012. 2013 is not quite out yet. Um, China is the number one sender of immigrants to Canada. That really hasn't changed in over 30 years. They've always been number one. Uh, Philippines and India have been number two and number three. Sometimes they change spots. But if you take 
uh, look at the pie chart there, actually, over half of all immigrants who come to Canada these days come from areas in and around uh, China. Immigration is also largely a phenomenon of the young. According to the United Nations, over 60% of the world's migrants move prior to their 30th birthday. In Canada, it's the same. Why is that? If you attended the session of Jean Young yesterday, she took a look at youth employment in Indonesia, Philippines, and Sri Lanka. What she found was they had very high rates of unemployment for young people and very low wages. In fact, if you pool these three countries together, 93% make less than $2 a day. So there's a large push factor of, my, of, of young people moving out of these countries into countries like mine. She also mentioned that after college graduation, over 25 million young people in China are unemployed. So you can see why immigration would be a, a largely young phenomenon. And you can see this here. The, the, the largest groups here are the very newly working aged groups. And it tends to trail off that way. So um, Canadian immigration policy, despite the fact that it has elements to help people who are displaced and also to encourage family migration, is mostly geared towards labour migration. So between 2009 and the present day, 100% of the labour market growth in Canada is due to immigrants. And this is a pattern that's uh, true also in Europe and Japan. Also in common with Europe and Japan is the fact that Canadian population dis is declining rapidly. Without immigration, Canada's population actually would have begun to decline in 1996. This population decline will have profound effects on lifestyle, GDP, and political conditions of these countries. Much of the reason that capitalism works in these countries is because the continual creation of a larger and larger consumer market so when populations start to decline, so do the markets. So they come to Canada mostly to work. But they also create work for Canadians. In 2013 alone, the federal government invested over $600 million in settlement services. This does not include the funds that were invested by provinces and municipalities, plus all of the funds and volunteer work that are done by the ethno-cultural and religious groups of the receiving cities. Immigrants also bring with them uh, work and positive resources. They bring familial con connections, linguistic connections, and social connections. Companies that hire these immigrants uh, are more able to nimbly manage changes in the international and global labor markets and tend to be more successful. So just to prove the point here, um, that Canada's immigration policy is largely driven by its economic needs. This bit middle bar here is males and females. The percentage is over 60%. This, um, these bars here are family class. These are people who are sponsored by these people. So you can see that there's almost 90% of the immigrants who come to Canada come directly because of work reasons. But immigrants do have some difficulties when they move to Canada. There's evidence to suggest that the labor market precariousness of immigrants is actually higher than the Canadian born. During the 2008 recession, immigrants lost their jobs at a rate that was three times higher than that of Canadian born. And the effects of the recession were felt the most uh, on people who were newly arrived. So if you look at the unemployment rate of immigrants in 2008, it rose by 5.7% compared to the unemployment rate rising amongst Canadian born at 1.6%. This is because immigrants tend to take on survival jobs at the start of their uh, life in Canada to, until they can find jobs in their area of expertise. But what happens is, is that the industries that tend to employ these people are the ones that are most hit by the recession and that would be the manufacturing and transportation sectors. Now, a lot of people in Canada feel very negatively about immigrants, and they believe that immigrants take more in their services than they actually give back to the economy. This notion is actually false. 
Immigrants provide much needed labor to offset Canada's aging population. They pay into the public pension and tax system, which support the services that we need for our ever-growing elderly population. Over a lifetime, immigrants use far less services than they actually pay in taxes. This is even true when we add in this $600 million per year that the government pays for settlement services. People often ask me, well, why is this? It's because of the rigorous medical screening that newcomers must pass in order to enter the country, and the fact that, you've, that in order to migrate anywhere, you have to be what we would call an A-type personality, a very driven person. Um, so what happens is, is that immigrants, on average, are significantly more healthy than the Canadian-born. And in fact, they tend to age more healthy than the Canadian-born do as well. So it's not that immigrants don't get sick, they just don't get as sick as Canadian-born. So as a result, they use far fewer social services. In fact, uh, we've calculated they use two-thirds less social services and health services than people born in Canada. So what this means is that immigrants actually pay, or they're a net benefit, into the health system and social service system in Canada, and they keep our labor market afloat. One of the big things about immigrants is that they tend to move to Montreal, v Toronto, and Vancouver, but the job uh, availability there isn't very good. So we ask why. Um, and one of the number one reasons is that people move to where they know people, where they have family, where they have a linguistic connection, a cultural connection, a religious connection. So it's no accident that the big cities of Toronto, Vancouver, and Montreal are very attractive to this group of people. These are old cities, they're old immigration cities, and they have huge ethno-cultural communities. These large and diverse populations lend themselves to what Raymond Breton uh, referred to as the institutional completeness, meaning that immigrant communities are so large and established that they can provide most services in languages appropriate to newcomers. So in the case of Vancouver especially, the presence of such large chap Chinese populations means that accessing health care, tax preparation, other social services, restaurants, cultural services, etc., are uh, widely available in the Chinese language, and so it's a very comfortable place for them to li live. There are also language benefits to living in the big city. Research in Canada reveals that by the third generation, so the grandchildren of immigrants, are are likely to have completely lost their heritage language. So if you move to a city like Vancouver, Toronto, and Montreal, you might have a chance of preserving or handing that language down to your grandchildren. It also provides large industries that can employ people who don't necessarily have to speak English. So we think about the meatpacking industry, the fast food sector, and the service sectors, for example. And these, in turn, as they recruit newcomers, more and more come, you have more and more people, you have a bigger and bigger linguistic and cultural community to rely on. And the Canadian government uh, also relies on this as well, um, especially through their temporary foreign worker program. They recruit people from around the world to work in industries where Canadian-born people tend not to work. Um, but there have been some abuses of this, of this system. Most recently, the mining industry in British Columbia was uh, uh, punished because they uh, ran ads in which they required immigrants or required the workers to be fluent in Mandarin, which meant that Canadian born people need not apply. There was a human rights complaint that was launched, but it actually was overturned. So, in the two minutes that I have left, I'm going to tell you about one policy that the government has adopted called the Provincial Nominee Program. This program is supposed to help fast track immigrants to Canada, but not to live in Montreal, Toronto, and Vancouver. The idea is to identify immigrants who can work in industries where there is a need for labor outside these three larger centres. What has happened, however, is it has been successful. We get about 40,000 people a year under this program. The problem is, is that after their contracts are up, and it's usually a three-year contract, you know what happens? They move to Montreal, Vancouver, Toronto, because that's where their family, friends, cultural, and, and uh, religious institutions are. 
So a lot of the smaller centers don't have a very good track record of uh, keeping people there. So in conclusion, what we found actually is that uh, there's a large secondary migration amongst people who uh, participate in the provincial nominee program. Um, about a third of people who are attracted to Canada actually move once they, once they arrive in Canada. So they move to Toronto, Montreal, or Vancouver. Quite frankly, actually, they mostly move to Toronto or Vancouver. They don't move to Montreal very much. Um, it has helped a little bit in some areas of the country. So in my province, they've been relatively successful. But that's because the smaller centers have worked really hard to provide appropriate language training classes, to build temples for people, and to make them feel welcomed. But in other areas of the country, it hasn't worked so well. But the people who do stay outside of Montreal, Toronto, and Vancouver, when you survey them, are actually more satisfied. So if you look at life satisfaction indices, 85% of immigrants who live outside the three big cities are actually happier than they would be if they're in Montreal, Toronto, and Vancouver. They're also more likely to be employed. They also have higher wages. And they're actually more likely to be working in the field that they were trained to work. So in short, if you can persevere and stay in these smaller centers, you're going to have a better economic life. Whether or not you have a better social and cultural life is a question that uh, needs to be left uh, for another day. Thank you very much for your attention. I'd just like to uh, recognize my research assistants and my funding assistants. And I do have a written copy of the paper if you're interested, so you're welcome to email me for that. Thank you.